I'm Tracy. And I'm Sharon. And we are Feet of Clay. Confessions of the Cult Sisters. Oh, well, first of all, folks, I want to thank you so much for your patience and waiting for us to return from our little break. <laughs> yes. Uh, but for those who have been paying attention during our break, we did do one episode, Sharon. We did. Uh, we did a follow-up to the plane crash on the anniversary of July 28th from the 1982 plane crash. That's episode 46, so we'll put that in our show notes. And we also did an interview with our favorite bros from Down Under, mm-hmm. Troy and Brian. Troy and Brian. Yay! Yes, our little bros. <laughs> so we'll be sure to link that episode in there as well. That was on their podcast. I was a teenage fundamentalist. Yeah. Yes. Yes, it was. Uh, so we haven't just done nothing, Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> that would be nice for a change. <laughs> that would be nice. And of course, all of that was happening all the while. We were also doing some research for this podcast. And unfortunately, this isn't as cheery um, as the one that we did with our bros, Troy and Brian. No. Um, we had mentioned that in our last episode that we were preparing for a really difficult topic. Mm. Um, and as it turned out, there's a whole lot more complexities that are intertwined with other stuff than we originally anticipated. That's right. So, um, Brace yourselves, everyone. This is going to be another one of those multi-episode topic situations. <laughs> yes, because we are so good at that. And I was thinking... So good. <laughs> that's the beauty of this medium, right? We don't have so many pages that you have to keep in a book that, you know, Sharon, it's our podcast and we can have as many episodes as we want. <laughs> we can take our own damn time. We can do what we want to oh. do. Yeah. And we are going to delve pretty deeply into those like unexpected interconnections that we started to see specifically with the Jesus movement of the 1970s. Mm. And then of course, the unhealthy ramifications of the purity culture that morphed from that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. The purity culture. I mean, I think that's how we started our podcast. We did this whole series on purity culture and Sharon, it's just, it's just like the toxic, shit that just keeps on taking and (laughs) keeps on reappearing. And it's like, God, the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah. But not, but taking, but taking. taking. That's why I said it just keeps on taking, 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 taking. But look, instead of keeping everybody hanging in suspense with all of this uh, preamble that (laughs) we are also very good at (laughs) and set up. All right. We're going to just drop the big bomb now. And then we're going to take our time sifting through the rubble and the collateral damage. Yeah. So at this point, I do want to offer a very important trigger warning. We are going to be talking about sex crimes against children. Mm -hmm. I hate that we are going to be talking about that, but we are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So please be mindful as to whether this is appropriate for any others who, if you're listening in the car, might be present. And of course, if this is a particularly trigger warning for you, be mindful as well so that you take care of yourself. Yeah. And and opt out at any point if you need to. So here goes. This involves Steve Grison. He is the owner of the, I guess, quote, Christian film company, Exploration Films. Steve is also the husband of the really beloved singer from Second Chapter Vax, the music group, for those who may not be familiar with that, the husband of Nellie Ward. So in September of 2022, Steve was arrested in Colorado Springs for solicitation of a trafficked 14-year-old girl. It just gives me chills Mm -hmm. to say that again. And then in March of 2023, six months later, he pled guilty to this felony sex crime. Hmm. And as you can imagine, this has been incredibly shocking and also 
Sharon, intense for us. Mm -hmm. And for those who really aren't in this sphere, um, Steve and Nellie were a part of the band's second chapter of Acts. We'll put links to that music there. Has really incredible memories for us, right? Gorgeous music. Yeah, gorgeous music. And, you know, of course, they were also our next door neighbors out in the ranch in Texas that was bordered to the Last Days Ministries property. Mm -hmm. Uh, So... Very, very, very intense for us, really personal for us on many levels. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's one of those things, I think if you hear this in other circles, they're like, okay, tell us something new. It's another headline, right? Another headline from a preacher. And it's really easy to really lose that personal connection. And it's very different, Sharon, when you're reading these headlines and it's a public persona, but it's also someone that's very personally connected to us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, And of course, he was intertwined um, in our former community. Some of those out there who may know Second Chapter may not at all be familiar with the name Steve Grison because, you know, he didn't necessarily have the public persona that everyone would have name recognition. Of course, his wife did. Um, But for us, he was very interconnected. And for all, you know, we talk about the little Christian Hollywood that was out in the Garden Valley, Lindale, Texas area, very well known in the production side of things and, you know, in scheduling and uh, very prominent Mm -hmm. in uh, this sphere. Yeah. So it, it was something that hit me. And then, Sharon, it's been very interesting for me to see even how much more it has hit you. Yeah. Yeah, I I have been surprised by the emotional impact on me as well, you know, because I mean, here's someone I I could never in a million Mm. years have imagined him committing such a crime. And my relationship with Steve and Nellie over the years, yeah, I I mean, of course, it wasn't like we were best friends, not that at all. But it was definitely much more than just casual acquaintances. So, you know, we had social, non-ministry time interactions. And yeah, it's just been a giant Mm. mountain of intensity for me. Of course, you know, anger and disgust and pain are there thinking about all this. But also compassion and just a deep, deep heartache thinking about Nellie and their two sons who are obviously adults now. And uh, yeah, we're going to have a lot to explore about all of that in a subsequent episode. So yeah, but but to sum it up, I was absolutely stunned. Absolutely. Yeah. And I just want to punctuate that because, you know, when we talk about these headlines that are so easy to read, when you have that personal connection, and you know the sons of this family and yeah. the wife of this family. I mean, it really just does make these incidents all the more painful. And so I appreciate you calling out that compassionate side because there's always fallout with this, right? There's mm-hmm. always people that are caught up in the fallout of of all of this shit. Yeah. Now, you know, Tracy, on the one hand, we could say this is sort of, you know, old news, right? Mm-hmm. Because Steve's arrest was, well, it was almost exactly two years ago right now. We're always the last but... to know, Sharon. <laughs> We're always the last to know. Are we? I mean, that flew totally under the radar, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, at least for us, because neither you nor I had heard a single word about it, not a whisper. Nothing. Nothing. Uh, nothing. That is up until about two months ago when one of our listeners sent us a link to a news item from March of 2023. And at first, like when I read the headline and I saw the mug shots, <laughs> I just thought this is a ridiculous joke in really bad taste. It just seems so outlandish. And I was sure it was a total fake, a total scam, you know, like a clickbait thing. Right. And I, I, it's funny because I immediately messaged you, Tracy. <laughs> I warned you, don't click on this. This is this is messed up. Yeah, you. I was driving at the time, and you not only messaged me; it was 
actually in also response to the person who sent the oh. link of like, this is a scam. I don't know who this person is. <laughs> and so I'm I'm driving and I'm looking at it and I know this person and I've been corresponding with this person. I'm like, oh no, 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 no. He's not, <laughs> he's not scamming us. But I still did not have any clue what the link was because I hadn't, you know, clicked into the link. Oh, and okay. Absolutely not prepared to read what then we read. Yeah. Yeah. And I know, you know, again, saying we can be so desensitized to this kind of stories. I mean, I know I followed a couple on Instagram or on TikTok and people, you know, are now just going, what else is new? Right. Right. But this one, you know, as we said, just hit so close to home. And I, I think that since it flew under the radar, people can be like, well, why didn't you let it keep flying under the radar? Mm -hmm. Like, why are you going to bring this up? Huh. And especially for those who are connected from our former circles, mm -hmm. you know, what would be our purpose? What would be our purpose to bring this back up? Uh, Check our hearts, right? Check our hearts again. <laughs> Yeah, we have that whole thing of do a heart check. You know, what What would be our reason? What would be um, the point of, you know, causing pain for some people who may not have known that this happened? And I think for me, Sharon, this is something that happens time and time again. I mean, even looking at the story of Mike Bickle, I don't think any of us were prepared for the stories that came out of him being with a minor, of him mm -hmm. committing, you know, sex crimes against a minor. These things are beyond uh, our imagination. It is, especially for the circles <laughs> and the amount of holiness and the amount right. of character and the amount of teachings that we had on that. And knowing that these people weren't just charlatans out there trying to, you know, make as much money as they could, or are they? Mm. Um, but really feeling that we knew you know, a level of commitment that we, you know, experienced being in that close proximity. And so, you know, seeing these things are like, why is this continuing to happen in these spheres so much? And, you know, my theory has always been, is there something in these circles that, you know, Christianity is supposed to be exempt from all of these kind of terrible sins that the world commits? But is there something happening in these fundamentalist circles that's actually creating the problem? Or magnifying. Or right? magnifying the problem. Yeah, yeah. And we just thought it would be really important to explore, you know, this very human problem. But is there information that we can kind of dive into with ultimately sharing the hope of preventing more people from becoming victims of these horrible crimes? Right. Yeah. I mean... That's why. That's why. And as I said, we're going to have a lot to say about this from several different angles, like mentioned the kind of unexpected connections, the whole glorification of the 1970s Jesus mm. People movement. But first things first. <laughs> so after I kind of started to get over that initial like out of body shock experience. Yeah, I, which took you a pretty long time, right? Yeah, yeah. It was like a week or so. Yeah. And weren't you having dreams, Sharon? Oh, my God. Every night, every night I was yeah. having dreams about Steve and Nellie and the situation. And just it was it was heartbreaking. So mm. yeah, so I felt really surreal for a number of days. And then after that, the first thing that you suggested, and I totally agreed with was that no problem can be solved if we collectively don't truly understand it. So we knew we needed to talk with an expert to help us get some better insights about these sexual crimes against children and teens mm. and the psychology behind it and what's happening on the inside of the people committing these unthinkable acts. Yeah, because it's more than just the devil, right? The devil right. just has marked them as a special, <laughs> you know, vessel for God. And so they're just attacking them more. We know that's not the answer. No. And so, you know, we did reach out to some experts, even in these deconstruction spaces, right? That mm -hmm. talk about purity culture and its negative impacts. But Sharon, I have to give it to you. Your dogged research, you ended up not finding <laughs> 
just one expert, but two experts um, who our audiences most likely have not been able to hear before. So good job, Sharon. Good job. <laughs> well, thank you. They, yeah, they are not in the religious deconstruction space at all. Yeah. Which is so great. I think that's so great to be able to hear it completely from outside of these circles. So I was very, very excited that you were able to find them. Mm. And so that is where we are going to begin today. We're going to be talking with these experts to help us start really just sifting through. And I think this is fair to call it the shit ton of shit, the big buckets, right? Through this <laughs> pile of shit. No, no, no. This is a megaton. Oh. This is a megaton. Just when we thought the shit tons couldn't get any shittier. <laughs> Surprise. Oh. oh, God. Yeah. we And we were able to record the following conversation just two weeks ago. So, folks, we weren't all on break <laughs> when you haven't necessarily <laughs> heard from us. And, and honestly, Sharon, I was so honored to be able to, to sit with them. And I think we're particularly honored to share this with our listening audience. Yes. Again, I know we're, we're laughing because you and I, um, I think, have to kind of attack some of this terrible stuff with some humor. Yeah. Uh, but it is a very heavy and complex topic. So please, please, again, take time for yourself. If at any point you can't handle it, opt out. Do what's best for you personally. Okay. With no further ado. So we have some really amazing guests today. The host of a podcast. Guys, this one is just incredible. <laughs> I've been binging it like crazy. LA Not So Confidential. Mm -hmm. And we are so fortunate to be joined today by the hosts of that show, Dr. Shiloh and Dr. Scott. So we'll tell you just a little bit about them. They're based out of Southern California. They both have advanced degrees in psychology, and they have specialized expertise in forensic psychology and sexual criminology. And obviously, that's, that's why we're looking and leaning heavy on them to help us understand this shit. So in addition to their clinical private practices, they also work alongside local and state law enforcement. Yes. So say hello, Dr. Shiloh. Hi, Sharon. Hi, Tracy. How are you guys? Wonderful. Great. Dr. Shiloh is a licensed forensic psychologist. She spent 14 years working with high-risk sexual offenders alongside probation and parole. When in private practice, she provided clinical services and assessments for individuals facing the criminal justice system. And alongside her, we have Dr. Scott. Say hello, Dr. Scott. Howdy. Good morning. Wait, I just had a flashback to um, Rocky Horror Picture Show. Dr. Scott! <laughs> oh, no, I know. I was going to say that. <laughs> Rocky. I was going to say that, but I was Janet. I was going to wait until I told the audience a little bit about Dr. Scott. And that's so my generation, by the way. I mean, like, that is my generation. I'm sure we're not yeah. the only ones who have said that. So Dr. Scott is a licensed clinical psychologist and marriage and family therapist and has worked in the California Department of Corrections. In his private practice, he focuses on specialized populations family therapy, anxiety disorders, and identity development, which is going to be perfect for what we want to discuss today. Yes. And as I've mentioned already, their podcast is amazing. I've been binging it like crazy. I'm, I'm up to almost 20 episodes now. And guys, I absolutely love your tagline, which is psychology, true crime, and snark. Trust us, we're doctors. <laughs> so welcome, Dr. Shiloh and Dr. Scott. Thank you. I hope the tagline warns people to not take us too seriously, <laughs> even though our show can be incredibly clinical at times and it's not for everyone, but um, we're just human beings too. <laughs> Awesome. Excellent. Yeah. So I think our listeners are very used to the snark factor. Excellent. And, you know, we are we are constantly diving into some pretty heavy and deep topics, but we also push people say, hey, you need to go, you know, seek your own therapy and help us guide you to where that would be. So so that that fits in perfectly with us. Yeah. And I have learned so much from your podcast, and that's why I was telling Tracy, we have got to bring these folks on 
to help educate us more and also Mm -hmm. to share your insights with our listeners. And again, I know you guys are super busy, super in demand, and really, really appreciate you and, and very honored to have you joining us. Thank you so much. You know, we we feel like we kind of inhabit a pretty special place within the true crime community. Um, we're not everybody's cup of tea, and that's okay. You know, it's great that there's a lot of quality stuff out there for everyone. But one of the things that we really wanted to do in creating our podcast was just really provide real psychoeducation about all the aspects of criminality and and diagnoses, mental health diagnoses that have a nexus to crime. And because there was, I mean, it was Shiloh that pointed it out years ago to me that there was really not a lot being explained about the drives. Um, There was just a lot of focus on the gore and the things Mm -hmm. that really, you know, kind of, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I don't mean to sound pejorative when I say salacious, but there is a lot of salacious material out there that's really good. I mean, I really enjoy it myself. But yeah, some people will give us these reviews of like, wait, this is too clinical. I feel like I'm in class. It's like, <laughs> yeah, it's, that's kind of what we intended, right? Yeah. Well, and I, I love it. It's funny. My husband has actually been, we've been in the car a few times listening and he'll go, you really love this because they're really detailed <laughs> and they're really research-based. You love it, don't you? I'm like, oh yeah, baby. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and Sharon's background is animal behavior. So this is right up her alley as far as I think part of why she's been so intently. And uh, a, a little bit of our background and of course our audience you know, we'll be hearing this from our previous podcast, but in this sphere, we're not educated well about mental health issues, right? In the ex-evangelical area, many of us are coming from that. And, you know, it was all about, you just need to pray harder. You need to believe harder and mental illnesses, mental issues are really not focused in on. So I think this is why you guys are such an important guest into this sphere, because you bring that, that snark with the clinic. <laughs> benefit. So we're very excited. This is exciting for us. Absolutely. All right. Well, what has actually brought us together today is something not fun at all, especially for me and Tracy. And that is the recently revealed crime of Steve Grison. We will have already talked about who he is uh, ahead of time, but people can refer back to that as far as our relationship with him. So this was in Colorado Springs, Colorado, September 7th of 2022. Steve was arrested. He had been messaging with, unbeknownst to him, an undercover detective from the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force. He was involved in solicitation of a child for prostitution. So after texting with this detective, who twice confirmed that the age of the girl was 14, Steve agreed to pay $170 for sex with her. He showed up with $180 in his pocket. I don't know. Hmm. Maybe he was going to be generous with a tip. Yeah, generous, generous. (laughs) Or he stopped by the ATM and didn't break it it into tens, right? (laughs) There you go. There it is. So smart. Maybe he would have asked for change. Who knows? Oh, God. (laughs) Anyway, um, God, this is horrible to laugh at, but, but you got to. 68 years old at the time, so just the creep factor there is huge. In March of 2023, so six months later, he pled guilty to the Class 4 felony. And in, I don't know if this is based on Colorado state law or federal law, he can still vote. He cannot own a gun, but his spouse can own guns. Hmm. Yeah. And, you know, we when we first heard about this, we thought it was a scam link because there was no way that that we believed this at first without some corroboration. And so to read that he actually pled guilty, you know, was something for us. So in May 2023, he was actually sentenced. And this is where we'd love to get your input. I think reading this, our jaw dropped that he received no jail or prison time. Um, He did have to register as a sex offender, and then he was sentenced to five years in the Colorado's Sex Offender Intensive Supervision Probation Program, which that acronym, which you guys are probably familiar with, new to us is SOISP. Yeah. So I don't know if they say SOIPS. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) Who knows? (laughs) 
And then as far as payment hitting his pocketbook, he had court fees of $1,728.50, a fine of $1,500. And that was broken down to $1,000 for sex offense, $500 for crimes against children. He has to pay the probation supervision fee of $3,000. I'm assuming that's for the five-year program. I don't know if there's going to be any additional fees uh, as time goes on. So his grand total was $6,228.50. And, you know, I I will tell you guys, Shiloh Scott, that just like rocked my world. Like, you're kidding. This guy was going to fuck slash rape a 14-year-old, and this is what he is paying? And... I also wondered how that might compare to the sentences or the fines for other types of attempted felonies. Any ideas on that? Yeah, I mean, of course, it varies state to state. And um, we have two ways in which a lot of sex offenses are prosecuted, either at the state level or at the federal level. Um, It just depends. And especially when there's a element of the Internet being used that can fall into a federal jurisdiction. And that's the majority of who was investigating this at first, because nobody really had jurisdiction over the internet and websites other than the FBI. It Mm. kind of just defaulted to them. And we're talking, you know, uh, late 90s, early 2000s, when uh, mid 2000s, when I started to come into this work, the bulk of it really fell on to the FBI to investigate this and prosecute this. That Hmm. has since changed, of course. Um, Local law enforcement has been able to get educated and trained on how to um, perform these investigations, but not only that, develop these task forces that then can do some of the preventative type work, if you will, you know, some of the to catch a predator Mm -hmm. work in which they are setting up stings. So having said that, this case being prosecuted at a state level, I mean, I'm most familiar with California, of course, but this is pretty par for the course, especially Mm -hmm. if he did not have prior violent offenses or Mm -hmm. prior sexual offenses. Um, And it all comes down to how we end up doing risk assessment for future recidivism, Um, which, of course, you know, we can get into later, but just to... To answer your question, um, doesn't surprise me at all that he did not get any prison time. If he had been prosecuted federally, I think that would have been very, very different. Right. If it had gone across state lines, that's a whole different game. Okay. If he had traveled across state lines. Right, Shiloh? Right. But he didn't even have to. If he was using the internet to contact this person, it could have been a federal case and he certainly would have gone to prison. Okay. And yeah, it's again, it, you know, the the legal world is a labyrinth. I mean, it really is. Mm-hmm. There's this sort of, you know, so much detail and variance between different laws from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And I would think that I'm not super familiar with this case, but I would conjecture that intent had a big part of it. Like what did he intended to do this? But there are two things. It it was not a legitimate child. You know, mm-hmm. it was an operation, right, to I don't want to say it was a, it was a sting, but it's not entrapment. But it's like, you know, they're they're judging on the intent. And then it would have been, you know, it would have been a completely different crime if there had been contact with an actual underage individual. Mm-hmm. And I, I mean, we can all have a lot of feelings about this and, and they're all legitimate. But and I have to divorce myself from my emotional reaction as well to go okay, well, this is what the system supports right now, and maybe it should be different. And then then there becomes the issue of legislature from state to state and how much states lean in which political direction and have higher populations versus more rurally scattered populations, you know, because the mm. more and this is something that is very much about has to do with your backgrounds is the wider the population is spread out, the more people can have these individualized Uh, belief systems and religious systems and cult systems Mm -hmm. that don't have to, you know, they're, they're operating outside the eyesight of large urban populations where law enforcement is. Does that make Mm -hmm. sense? Yes. Yes, that makes sense. Um, And so I guess to follow up with that, when they perform what we would call a sting operation, is that usually tipped off because 
there's either a known ring uh, with no priors, I guess, like what would usually tip off some kind of sting operation such as this? I don't think it's necessarily um, something like that where there's a tip where there's, you know, predators essentially looking for prey (laughs) to... You know, from the law enforcement side, I I was a police officer before I was a psychologist. Oh, wow. It could be as simple as maybe a certain police department gets a grant that goes towards Mm -hmm. sex trafficking or money that goes towards reducing sexual offenses. Now, could they win or be awarded that grant because there's been an increase or a problem? Perhaps, but sometimes money just needs to get doled out. And so they could have folks that were recently trained up um, and have the infrastructure in place to be able to set up the sting and unfortunately can be like shooting fish in a basket. Hmm. Yeah. And one of the reasons I like what you said, Dr. Scott, of being able to kind of step back and divorce yourself from the emotions and this, that's been really hard for us to do on this one specifically. Of course. And why this this case matters so much to us, because it comes from those circles and this particular man comes from those circles where helping trafficked individuals is usually a main ministry in these centers and <laughs> these circles, right? Like they actually have donations and set up huge, you know, uh, organizations to save children from trafficking, of which we know he's been connected to. And so... Uh, this this is really causes us to gasp emotionally on so many levels. And of course, then it's Sharon's own personal connection. We all have somewhat of a personal connection from our former time at the ministry that we live next door to them. Uh, but Sharon, even more so through the years. Yeah. And I, I don't need to go into that now. We talked about that or we'll talk about that more later. But I think yeah, I mean it's it's the hypocrisy is is stunning. Someone who's very high profile in Christian film and in in music and and of course just on the personal level too because it's not just a crime but you've got the betrayal of his wife Nellie and their sons and it's a very widespread problem and Tracy you've had a bit of a theory here too, right? Yeah. So one of the the main reasons I wanted to talk about this, and I was going to forward a a link to several articles to you all, which I didn't do, but I can. Uh, It's it's called the Julie Roy's Report. And she basically keeps track of all the investigations of the pastors, the ministers that have been now accused, not just of sex, you know, adultery, it's bad enough in that sphere, but of the amount of having either sex crimes or or exploitation of minors. And it is what we would call almost at epidemic levels now. And I don't know if it's just because of our ability to communicate now. Um, It's one right after the other. And so, of course, I'm not a psychologist and I don't know what uh, research has been there. But we come from what we call purity culture, which has a very strong sense of repression of your sexuality from the time you are a child born into these circles to then if you're an adult and you convert into these circles, it really, you know, in my theory is an arrested development that happens at a crucial part of their lives that kind of seems to be this branch that comes out of there. So I want to, I'm very interested in what you guys know about that and what you think about that and why there seems to be this, this massive epidemic of, of trusted professionals, trusted pastors and priests and ministers having so many incidents of this. So one of the things I would say is taking a couple of steps back to the phenomenon to which you're speaking has so much to do with uh, electronic communication and media and access. So, and look, I, I come from a what was a small town in northern Alabama. That's where I grew up. I was part of the United Methodist Church. I'm no longer part of the United Methodist Church. However, it was a great church to grow up in um, with a very much a focus on uh, community works and what is your role, what is your purpose, you know, how do you take care of your of, of the community? So there were it was a very loving, supportive message at that time. But I was exposed to other people 
who were much more strongly um, attached to dogma within their particular uh, denomination. Mm -hmm. And what I've noticed over the years is that those ministers would be sort of landlocked in their own church. And it's like you would be drawn because someone would say, hey, I I go to a great church, come with me. And that whole landscape has changed in the past 40 years. Certainly there was televangelism, you know, that started in the 70s. I remember like in college, we used to just get completely bonkered out of our mind and watch late night televangelism because it was so <laughs> over the top. Tammy Faye. <laughs> no, it was more than Tammy Faye. It was Ernest Angley. Do you guys remember Ernest oh, Angley? Yes. They would heal you through the television and mm-hmm. his in his powder blue tuxedo and his toupee. Yeah. Also brought up on sex charges, by the way. Wow. But yeah, uh, so the proliferation is I just think it's on an exponential level due to social media. And everybody with a camera and an internet commercial, even if their church is 300 square feet in a mini mall, they can get on and they can spout all sorts of just craziness. And like, and there is sort of this human algorithm that's involved. It's like, well, how do you get more listeners? You get more listeners by being more extreme. And then you buy into like this literalism interpretation of your dogma, which puts a focus on exactly where you started out, Tracy, on this purity culture, Mm -hmm. this weird interpretation of virginity that is wildly different. If you talk to any Bible lit scholar, you know, you'll Mm -hmm. you'll understand that that's completely wrong. And then, of course, what it morphs into is this what I find. I can't think of enough horrible adjectives to describe how gross purity balls are. Mm -hmm. Um, This whole movement of the father entering into a spiritual marriage with their child or giving over their child to a spiritual, you know, connection to Christ or, or God. It's just the ultimate and creep factor because it continues to marginalize and objectify women. Yes. As just separate from individual identity as separate from healthy expression of sexuality. And that's the seed, you know, that's the evil Mm -hmm. seed that is planted. Um, to control people. And of course, as Dr. Shiloh can, can really explain is that predators find positions of power Mm -hmm. where there are opportunities to take advantage of children. Yeah, certainly. I think, um, if you have someone that is already, um, a predator, I mean, I don't know how, how else to say that because there's some that have already gotten into that behavior and those offenses and then they find professions usually that give them a lot of access and a lot of power over potential victims. Um, we see that in, you know, not just religious communities, but other types of organizations, of course. And I think the other thing that you touched on already, Tracy, as far as just kind of looking at this as all these other layers that are playing into this factor, you said you know, this seems like an epidemic, but is it really an epidemic Mm. or are we now feeling that it's okay to report? And I think that has been something that's been a thread throughout sex crimes throughout the decades. Uh, Because if you ask anyone now, they're usually like, oh my God, yes, sex crimes are just, you know, it's an epidemic. It's all over the place, human trafficking, sex trafficking. A lot of this stuff has been happening for a very, very long time. It's just that now we have a culture where more so than in the past, it's okay to report it. We're having more education mm. around it. It's mm. okay for male victims to come forward now when yes. they were perpetrated on by men or women. So there, there's certainly been an evolution in how victims come forward The frustrating thing is with all of the things we're going to talk about today and all of the research surrounding sexual offending and victims of sexual crimes is that we don't know what we don't know. And there still is so much that is left unreported. So the numbers are the best that we have. Are they truly accurate? It's really hard to say and probably not. We're probably missing a lot of stuff because when we can go back and again from the offender side, start exploring what behavior these people have been involved in 
we don't even have a point of contact with them until they come in contact with the criminal justice system, right? right. So until they have been caught. Mm. So there have been some helpful things. You know, we um, started implementing, you know, a couple decades ago, probably now, the polygraph to sex offender treatment here in California. It's one prong of what we call the containment model. So you have therapy um, and the clinician at one, it's like a triangle at one end of the prong. You have probation or parole, you know, whoever's monitoring them is another one. And then the last prong is using polygraphs. And then the offenders in the middle, they're kind of contained. I see. So yes, I I think that's really tricky. Um, And if your listeners, you know, want a little bit more, we did, I think, a two-parter at the beginning of this year, 2024, Scott, on um, child sex abuse scandal in the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's a lot of overlap in just, as you were alluding to, you know, sexual repression. And, um, you know, some folks get into that profession because that's what they're looking for. They're looking for the victims, but there's others that aren't, but they do get there one day. Yeah, I think that's so good just to talk about how we are in a landscape where it is easier to report. And of course, that's, you know, we would all consider that a good thing. And so I think what's very hard is the amount and the volume of cases that there are to report. Yeah, it's, it's heartbreaking. It really is. All right, guys. Well, look, I took a lot of notes <laughs> listening to <laughs> many of your episodes. And I've put together a list of terms and concepts that, uh, you know, your information really helped me start to get my head around it all. And we would love for you to discuss with us. So I kind of broke it out into chunks. First thing we'd like to touch on is some terminology and just general overview of some of these concepts. Yeah, and Sharon is a great note taker and you know I've I've looked over that but in our circles and I say circles but it's really what our listening audience is the exvangelical community right this very fundamentalist community a lot of a lot of rules and regulations around sexual behavior and so now you know what gets thrown around a lot is a pedophile everyone's a pedophile they're a pedophile and you know just this kind of you know, concept that all of these people are getting in, you know, as predators to basically serve their pedophilia. And I think seeing that it's, it's way more complex than that. And I think that's why we're interested in some of this terminology. Right. Certainly. I mean, it it drives me crazy in the media because they use Mm -hmm. it interchangeably um, with child molestation or other types of child abuse that is not appropriate. So I think that's a great place to start. Um, I also think a good disclaimer is sometimes we can come off a little clinical when we're talking about this. Um, You know, we're not research psychologists necessarily, but we are, you know, or have been sitting in conferences, sitting in trainings, reading tons of research papers. I just read a new one this morning to prep for this. Um, we can come across as just kind of talking about this stuff. Like it's, you know, our daily reading. Um, And I just, I want your listeners to know that, you know, certainly just because a majority of our work in sex crimes has been with offenders, that's the lens we're looking through. Mm -hmm. Both Scott and I, of course, in our private practices. And I mean, some of their, there's some overlap here, right? But we have certainly worked with survivors of sexual abuse as well. Mm -hmm. um, And our, incredibly mindful of that and those experiences. So just wanted to put that off the top. No, that's great. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. I just wanted to throw one thing out there that, that definitely is not too, uh, I don't think it's necessarily too clinical, but it offers a good framework is that there are so many levels of frustration with throwing the term pedophile around because on one, on one of the most base levels is when you use a term that is just this kind of broad range umbrella epithet, you actually water it down and dilute it and you, you make it less potent for 
the places where it actually should mm. be really strong so that we can do our work yes. so that we can stop these practices. Right. And what has happened is, is, and, and not like, and Sharon, I'm the same as you as I like, I have a really raw mouth because I work with cops all day <laughs> and I started out with a raw mouth. But here's the thing is that pedo or pedophile has, is now the new version of faggot. Right. Mm. Because faggot or uh, mm-hmm. diminutive, diminishing epithet terms are a way to push people down. It's a way to oppress people um, that you don't agree with. So now what we have is, you know, this sort of nationwide movement, like there's book bannings. And if you support a book that helps a teenager maybe understand their sexuality and not commit suicide, you're suddenly a pedophile. Right. Mm, right. So that's what's frustrating, too, is that you, we're just dealing with so much ignorance when it comes to this. And I mean, ignorant, like willful ignorance many right. times, you know, and, and the willful ignorance is when you was like, well, hey, let, let me let me educate you on this so that you as an individual are able to be aware of trafficking in your community or aware of abuse in your community. And people just can get so concrete that you you can't. You can't um, achieve the goal of that education. So sorry, that was my little soapbox about how to, it's a power drive. (laughs) I love that, Scott. And the thing that just, one of the things that just fucking frustrates me so much is that. Oh, Sharon, I love you so much. You're just like, (laughs) let's F-bomb together. I want to move to an island with you and we can F-bomb to our heart's delight. (laughs) Excellent. (laughs) Well, this idea, if what you really care about is people. And you really want to help prevent abuse. You really want to help abusers to not actually be self-destructive themselves. Because if you care and want to prevent things, you have to fucking understand what's going on. You've got to let go of your preconceived ideas and your quick little uh, labels. And reactivity. Yeah. And, and and reactivity. And what's interesting in that is uh, because obviously this is someone that we know and, and love, right? We love the community that is impacted by this, the fallout. And the flip side of the religious community, because of this belief in a real devil, that the devil sits out there just with, you know, big sexual temptation, right? That's his pitchfork of sexual temptation. And he's just going to hit all these faithful believers equally. And so then they kind of covered up of, we just all need to be forgiving and compassionate. He just got touched kind of by this satanic pitchfork of sexual crime. And the devil made me do it. <laughs> the devil made me do it. So then it's like they're trying to formulate a compassionate community, still all based on not real science, not real stuff, not real understanding. That also absolves the perpetrator. Yes. It absolves the perpetrator of the responsibility for that crime because it was an outside influence of dark yes. spirituality yes. that made it happen. It's the most unbelievable fucking mental gymnastics ever. <laughs> yes. We certainly have heard that as an excuse in sex offender treatment. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh. We could tell you stories about our clinical. Shiloh and I started out in a clinic, you know, doing pre and post incarceration treatment with sex offenders. And like we had, I had like, I really learned my poker face in that job mm. because you would hear things <laughs> that were so nuts that they completely believed. You just could not react to it. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. So this is why it's so exciting for us to have you all here because, you know, Sharon and I, although we have been accused of being, what, what's the latest, Sharon, that we're just... Our steaming vat of rebellious witchery. <laughs> rebellious witchery. Ooh, I love oh, that. Oh, I love that. You cauldron sisters. <laughs> Let's join. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Put that on a (laughs) T-shirt. Yeah. Amen. (laughs) But the reality is we have learned in our, you know, our own life, just the landscape of these mental health issues and so many mental health issues, real issues go undiagnosed, untreated, lied about. And so we have compassion, but not in the same thing of like, well, my sin's equal to their sin and, you know, the devil made them do it. So we're so excited that you have this background and that you're able to come bring this terminology to kind of understand it for what Sharon said. We really want to solve this in our culture. And that's, that's, you know, Scott and I would always get the question, how can you guys do that work? How can you work Mm -hmm. with those people? Right. And um, (laughs) we were one little cog in hopefully preventing future victims 
And That's awesome. Yeah. for us, you know, we had to have some meaning and purpose behind we, why we were doing it as well and why I went on to do it for so long. Um, and it, we both truly believe there are clinicians out there that are cut from different cloths that are just made to work with different populations. There are some that Scott and I would not never even touch because for us, you know, that would be too hard or that would be too triggering or what have you. For some reason, we we're able to do this and we're happy to be a part of hopefully identifying risk factors to prevent a future victim. Hmm. Um, so with that, I'm going to take one step a little bit backwards from pedophilia to talk about paraphilia real quick. Um, so paraphilias, it's a clinical term. If you think about it as the big umbrella term, and then pedophilia and hebophilia are going to kind of fit under there along with a gajillion other ones. But a paraphilia is essentially the experience of intense sexual arousal to atypical objects. Um, or it might be certain atypical situations, fantasies, behaviors, or even individuals. So the lay term for this or the non-clinical term that we often throw around is like a fetish, right? Your mm -hmm. people are interested in things that are a little different. But in terms of paraphilic disorder, it also has been defined as a sexual interest in anything other than a consenting human partner. Uh -huh. So that then starts to give us a little flavor of like, oh, some of these could actually be illegal or criminal. But the last little piece of criteria on there is that the attraction and for clinical purposes for us to diagnose someone with a paraphilic disorder that attraction actually has to rise to the level of being distressing to that person that has that attraction. So distress is kind of a vague term, and we have it like that on purpose. So we can just individually look at this person's life and say, how is this bothersome to you? Why are you seeking therapy for it? Um, you know, what sort of clinical inter interventions can be done for it? In, and that can come to light in a lot of different ways. So you have paraphilias, and then pedophilia is a paraphilia. So when we're looking at the unusual or atypical sexual attraction in this case, for pedophilic disorder, it is specifically to be sexually attracted to prepubescent children. So hence, you know, what we see in the media or what we tend to throw around is that sometimes there can be an offense against a teenager and someone says pedophile. So that would be incorrect. Incorrect. Because most teenagers are post-pubescent. Mm -hmm. Right. Dr. Shiloh, could you clarify prepubescent, pubescent, and post-pubescent for us? Sure. I mean, I clinically, we really just look at pre and post. Okay. Of course, you know, a, a, it takes a while, you know, for a child to fully transition into post-pubescence, if you will, but really we're looking pre and post. So pre would just be there really aren't any secondary sex characteristics that have developed yet in that child. There is, I think, I think it's the FBI in conjunction with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children who actually have a bit of a sterilized like rubric for when they have to examine photographs that come across mm -hmm. their desk to say about how old is this child you know they will very much look at are their hips developed are their breast buds yet um, is there any semblance of you know maybe some distribution of fat or weight gain in the way in which children develop you know all of the, I mean they have it down to something that can be tallied, essentially. A science. <laughs> Scored. Yeah, a science yeah. to where they, they have this tool, you know, for some of their investigations to be able to pinpoint the age almost as well as possible without ever meeting this child. Mm -hmm. But for sake of clinically, if we were to diagnose someone and start talking with them about their sexual attraction, the hard line there is looking at if they are attracted to body types where there is secondary sex characteristics or not. And an interesting note about that is when you interview and, and study and speak with pedophiles, that oftentimes, you know, we kind of have this myth that they have a preference of gender, 
like they prefer boys or they prefer girls. But we don't see that so much with pedophiles because if you think about it, their body types are actually pretty similar prepubescent. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, androgynous, really. Yeah, yeah. So they don't have as much of a preference per se. It's more, and you know, I, I, I won't get graphic here, but it's more about just the very petite, smooth, you know, non-curvy body type and a body that doesn't give off smells or, you know, it's just, it's mm -hmm. very, um, I hate to use this word, but this is one that they use, you know, it's just very pure. Mm, pure. That's exactly what I was thinking. And clean. Uncomplicated. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you mentioned a moment ago that the term pedophile is not interchangeable with child abuse, molestation. Could, could you speak to that a little bit more? Sure. Yeah, of course. So there are people who offend against children. Um, and when, when they, they get caught and they get assessed and or interact with the legal system and then eventually, you know, the mental health system, we have to determine what, what's the motivation here because it's important for us to understand them, mm -hmm. to in understand intent but also to understand risk and then ultimately to understand how to target their treatment. So there has been information that has shown that there are basically two categories. Those that are pedophiles that would meet the criteria for pedophilic disorder and those that don't, yet they still molested a child. Mm. And this could be a contact offense where they did offend against a child. So not every child molester is going to meet the criteria for pedophilic disorder. They could, certainly, and then we would put them into that category. Not every person who is a pedophile ever offends. We have many who have taken their own lives. We have many who have sought treatment. Um, we have had many who have, um, there's actually been, organizations started mostly online where they certainly never want to offend. And they're trying to figure out by talking to each other, how do you keep from offending? How do you deal with this struggle? So it, I think that helps parse it out for people that there are two different types of offenders. Now, the, those with pedophilic disorder are almost easier to wrap your mind around. Okay, there's this disorder. Um, maybe they offend, maybe they don't. The child molester who is not truly attracted to children, that one's harder to wrap your head around, right? Because mm, yeah. I, I think there would be some people out there that would say, oh, no, once once you've gone hands on with a child, all bets are off. You're a pedophile. Um, but we actually find that that's not true. Um, there are the majority of cases above and beyond when we look at the research are opportunistic and situational types of offenders. And, and that can vary. It doesn't mean that someone is a serialized offender in that way. That would definitely lean more towards uh, the paraphilia of being a pedophile. But there are some people who are just so criminally oriented and minded that they don't care who they're offending against. It mm -hmm. can be a person, place, thing. <laughs> they are just like tearing through committing offenses. But there can also be people when there is a number of different factors present in their life Perhaps their coping mechanisms for those are so faulty that it has ended up in a situation where they sexually act out against someone underage. Hmm. There are so many aspects that she's referring to regarding um, power and control hmm. and availability and positioning. You know, we we talk about sort of this overlap of potential diagnoses, but there aren't any stats that that distinctly show that every sex offender in this particular class of offense is diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder. There, there isn't anything that, that, that there's some tendencies and some trends, but what I can offer you is that there's a huge part of this population that are sexual offenders that while maybe not having a full diagnosis, have many qualities or, or flavors of antisocial acts, of antisocial behaviors, of narcissistic acts, of narcissistic behaviors, but they're not, they're subclinical. They're not reaching the point where it's an actual diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And usually we see more of that with those that offend against other adults. So rapists and right. sexual assaults. SVPs, sexually violent predators. 
So I just want to tell you how much I really, really appreciate that distinction. I mean, when I was listening to one of your episodes and you drew that line between someone with a paraphilic disorder of sexual attraction and arousal at the images of prepubescent children versus someone who makes the choice to act on violating a child. Those are two very different things. And in one of your episodes, you recommended, well, a lot of resources, and we're going to try to put a bunch of them up on our show notes. But one was the documentary, I Pedophile, and I believe that was Dr. James, I can't remember, Cantor. Cantor. Yes. And I'm going to really recommend that to our listeners as well, because one of the men interviewed said, why would I choose this? Mm. If I had a magic wand or if I could undo what's in my brain, I would. And it, it gave me a lot of sense of compassion for the difficulty that if some of these paraphilias are truly have a genetic basis to them, they are not a result of someone just, you know, going into moral degradation, but the fact that their brain is actually stimulated by a certain thing that is atypical, that is not a choice. And yet it's something that we as a society really need to have a better understanding of if we are going to truly be able to help make a difference and save a lot of children from being victims and also help individuals with the struggles that they face. Certainly. I mean, you have folks that feel that way and think that way as as you're speaking, the individual from the documentary. You also, though, have folks with a lot of cognitive distortions going on. And mm-hmm. Scott and I worked with them where You know, they absolutely believe that because they naturally feel this way, it must be natural and it should be allowed. Mm. Also, and and a delusory process as well. I mean, there's a, (laughs) there in in our hardcore pedophiles and hepophiles, the the misinterpretation of their environmental data is absolutely staggering. There are individuals who say, well, she was flirting with me. Like, no, sir, that. That child was six years old. Mm -hmm. That child. Oh, no. Children are very, very sensual and very sexual. No, (laughs) that's Mm -hmm. absolutely that's not true. That is you are misinterpreting signals from this individual. Oh, wow. Or they are choosing to misinterpret. And that's this is sort of their excuse. So, again, it just it's it's something that I think speaks to your original question is that. This requires understanding and challenging your own perspective and nuance so that we don't muddy the waters, because the more muddy the waters are, the more perpetrators have the ability to offend. Oh, that's so good. And, you know, what what our podcast is really based on is coming out of our own fundamentalism. We realized our own cognitive dissonance and there is an environment you know, that, you know, we've done a couple episodes where we reference it's easier for mental health issues to hide in plain sight because it's almost part of the teaching. It's almost part of the training. And so it's like an incubator where these things get to fester. And because there's no teaching, there's no training, there's no understanding, it all gets that, you know, that that label of it's just the devil trying to, to mess me up. And uh, this is you said, you know, so many great things just as far as that mental state and being in an environment of coercive control. That's the other thing that we talk a lot about that is so prevalent. And then uh, you had mentioned at at the beginning as far as, you know, we did we did an episode called Sex Evangelicals uh, <laughs> as we were coming out and discovering our own sexuality because we were so repressed and we had no grounding on what was natural development, normal development, and really believe that some of these paraphilias, and I don't know if you guys have much research on that as far as what you might be born with and then what you are made by that very much that conditioning that happens. And, you know, the, the the gist of that sex evangelical episode was many people coming out noticed that they would have what we would call kinks, mm-hmm. right? Sure. And I, I love that you differentiated 
what would be legal and not legal and consenting and not consenting. And I'll just add this, in this world of really coercive control, consent is not understood. (laughs) Sure. It's not taught. It's not respected. And so when you have women particularly coming, coming of age, it's, it's, it's not a factor. We have to take that into consideration. So anything you guys want to say about that? I know that's a lot of the topic, but well, it's so important. It is. It's very important. And the research community is not split, I would say, but they recognize that it seems as if certain interests and certain, let's say, atypical objects or things or situations might be biologically based, like you just might be wired that way for sure. And then it takes something to kind of wake that up one day, right? Like Epigenetics. Yeah. And if nothing woke it up, then okay, maybe, maybe we all have, you know, the potential for a lot of different kinks. Can it be conditioned? Yes. I mean, we certainly know it can be conditioned. And when you talk about pornography use and different genres and, you know, then getting into more and more taboo areas, certainly once you start, you know, some classic conditioning of pairing a bodily function like sexual arousal to a stimulus, then yes, we can certainly condition mm-hmm. that as well. But, you know, I, I think what the the research community in this area has made a bit of a distinction about is that sort of your non-paraphilic kinks, yes, they can just sort of be woken up or you can be uh, conditioned to it. They almost put, and I hate, I always hate saying this out loud because of, you know, what it can invoke in people. But, and I think James Cantor speaks to this, they put pedophilia because we have studied it so much and we know the wiring systems in the brain. They almost put that into terms of like a sexual orientation, not that it should be an allowed or appropriate or, you know, widely accepted sexual orientation in terms of how you act out on it. But they, they've they made that distinction. We have enough biological markers at this point to realize that those folks essentially are born that way. I, I hope that makes sense. And I, I hope that isn't too triggering to some of your listeners. It does make sense. And it's, and it's not, I, I get why, you know, we've got to be really, really careful when we say orientation. Right. But I like what you say about wired that way, because If someone is born absolutely hating cilantro or absolutely loving cilantro, that isn't a choice. Right. Now, if I want to eat cilantro, I think that that's okay and there's nothing illegal about it. And other than, I don't know, maybe maybe we're abusing the plant, but (laughs) there's not a consent issue like when you have another human being. There you go. That's the that's the key words. Consent. That is the key word. It, that is the big issue, is that a child cannot give consent. Yes. And for the most part, a lot of teens, even some that can legally, depending on the country or the state you live in, but if you look at their social development and their psychological and emotional maturity, they really are not in a position to give consent. And so it's really a question of whether you are victimizing someone, using someone, or whether it truly is an equally balanced power dynamic that would allow the person to make an independent choice. And I think that's where some of the the fuzzy line comes down to. Indeed. Yeah, it gets complex too, given world culture. Yes. You know, across the board, there are many different cultures. You know, we, we are, a, I wouldn't say a melting pot. We're like a really interesting textured salad here in the U.S. with mm-hmm. a lot of different cultural influences and just from state to state, right? But the the world is a very big place when it comes to how these kind of things are viewed. And even historically, our view of children and minors has changed. And we, Shiloh and I have done a couple of episodes about that as well, like the view of what is an adult? You know, when are you actually making adult decisions? And I, the reason I give that framework is that I, I, I it's, I definitely in this conversation today don't want to minimize or not hit on the fact that there are sexual predators who are who are experts at grooming and they have yes. intentionally 
created atmospheres where they engage the trust of the child. And especially the, in one of the, the, the most heinous examples are when predators will use phrases to younger you know, minors, basically, let's just say minors, whether they're rather regardless of their age of you're so special, mm -hmm. you're so mature, we have something special. And so that allows the predator to create a false sense of consent within that minor right. and to reinforce that within themselves. Right. Oh, so good. She gave me consent. He mm -hmm. gave me consent when what you're saying, Sharon, which is absolutely right, is legally a child cannot give consent for that. Right. Right. So and and then but there are ages, you know, even within the U.S., like it's mind blowing about like the age of consent mm -hmm. from state to state. Like, mm -hmm. I like, come on, it is 2024, folks. We need to all get on the same page about this. <laughs> I think the majority of states at 16, 17 and 18 are actually less common. Um, but that that makes for interesting um, legal cases. But if the age for marriage in some states is even lower than the age of consent, that is fucked up. <laughs> it is so <laughs> fucked up. And of course, like Utah, right? It's always in the news. Yes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and then you have like this sort of federal age of consent, which again speaks to a lot of internet crimes or crossing state lines, which is 18. So they're more conservative in that way. And I think I gave this example in one of our episodes where, you know, you can have a couple that's in a relationship physically and it's legal, but if she were to send him a nude picture via the internet or cross state lines, it's a federal offense. Wow. So you have all of these <laughs> discrepancies that you're right, Scott, like, let's just get on the fucking same page, please. Wow. <laughs> or we can force uh, we can force an individual to have a child in some states, even though they are not of an age where they have any rights as a parent, which is yeah. Like, yeah. also fucked up. Yes. You know, that's that's one of the things that's so complex about the way our country is set up. I did want to also add something kind of using a particularly bold example of mental health and sexual repression. You know, we have really gone backwards in the U.S. in ways that are so subtle that we've forgotten because you can go back and look at school, like elementary, middle and high school or what used to be called junior high hygiene films. Do you remember the terms hygiene films? Yes, mm -hmm. I and do. And they were beautifully constructed and very cut and dried, talking in terms that it could be understood by elementary and junior high school kids about the process of reproduction. That was sex education. And that was when pregnancy rates were lower among high schoolers, right? And now from state to state, we have these draconian laws. And even I've had the experience too of individuals who very, very well-meaning, but saying, well, I'm going to teach my kids that. Right. I want it right. to be my responsibility. Mm -hmm. And I've gotten into arguments because I will push back with, okay, your son is 14. When did you have that discussion? And there's just a blank stare. Right. right. Because they have not engaged in that discussion at all. And then I start getting really pissed and I go, OK, he's 14. And so most of the information he's gotten is probably really wrong. Yeah. From his peers and from TikTok. <laughs> right. And now yeah. TikTok. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and you're about seven years behind starting this conversation. So, again, the idea of repressing to the you know, the mental health issues that Tracy was talking about is really is exemplified so horribly in the tale of the Dugers and everything that mm -hmm. they've been through because, you know, I think it was Ginger because Ginger was the one, if anybody watches so, it's like you watch Ginger and it's like, she's the one that's going to break out. This is the one mm -hmm. that doesn't take shit and she's an insightful thinker. But she went to her mom to say, I, I need to talk to somebody. I need, I, need to, uh, I need counseling. I'm struggling with this. And her mom's response was, well, therapy, uh, like, no, that's just paying somebody to be your friend, you know, mm -hmm. so and her mom is a victim. I want to say also her mom is a victim of narcissistic abuse by the elder Duger. But there's a lot of repression when a child is given that message that their feelings aren't valid. Yes. Right. Their emotional experience is not valid. And even the kids were taught to do it to each other. 
you know, to shame women's bodies so that they gave each other clues. Like if they saw a girl walking down the street, they're supposed to give a code word to their brothers. Nike, look mm-hmm. down at your shoes. Mm-hmm. Well, when you, when you when you repress, when you say that those kind of urges are evil or sinful, mm-hmm. you're laying a groundwork for someone to act out in ways that are predatory later in life. So good. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Scott, there was something you said in one of your episodes. I paused and wrote it down because it was so fantastic. It was something about how here in the U.S. we seem to have, quote, quivering puritanical shame about all things related to sex. And that is so true. And it it is what absolutely shuts down education on just basic biology. Basics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The basics, the basics. Which is key here, for sure. I mean, it's it's key to preventing offenses. All right. I would like to circle back to this particular situation that we're dealing with, with, you know, my my friend, Steve Grison. And Scott, you mentioned a moment ago, you used the term hebophilia. And I'd like you to talk a little bit about that. And again, in the situation with Steve, we're dealing with he was ready to go pay money to basically, in my opinion, I don't know how else to say it, rape a 14-year-old. So not technically pedophilia, because we're going to assume that that 14-year-old was in early pubescence at the least. But yeah, I mean, that's just sick and fucked up. So can you guys talk about that a little bit and, and what could be behind all of that? Well, just quickly to build on what Dr. Shiloh laid down earlier. So we talk about pedophilia being generally, generally age 10 and under, but it's specifically about pre-secondary or it's just the primary sexual characteristics, which are very, you know, androgynous, um, no fat distribution, that sort of that body. Hebophilia is more looked at generally because trends happen in the world about early onset of menses, uh, secondary sexual characteristics. But generally, we're speaking about age 11 to 14. Hebe, it's I me, mean, it's drawn from just because I'm a big Greek mythology nerd. Hmm. Hebe was one of the minor goddesses of the hearth. And she was like a teenager, you know, sort of like like a, a a maidservant in the Greek pantheon, but she was a deity. So Hebophile particularly describes this age range. Oh, that's, that's interesting. When we're talking about a 14-year-old, you're right. There was intent. There was understanding that he was going to do something that was against the law, right? But there's also this term that's used in the ultra far end of the men's rights movements and the marginalization of women. And I'm, I apologize because this is such a gross statement is – if it bleeds, then it breeds. Mm. Right. So the excuse is if a, if a woman is at the point where she is exhibiting menses, which means she's of reproductive capability, then it should be open season. Mm. If she's able to reproduce, I should have access to her for my needs. And there's there's a real, like you're saying, cognitive dissonance or cognitive um distortion would probably be Mm. more accurate in this mean of of justifying that. That's good. Yeah. So just want to be very clear, though, that it's not interchangeable with crimes of molesting or abuse or exploiting, like Dr. Shiloh was saying. It's about insight, willingness to have insight into our own shortcomings in order to develop an emotional IQ and adult sensibility. Is it normal or like a clinical term? Is it within normal limits? You'd see this on reports sometimes talking about behaviors or presentation as a WNL within normal limits. Is it within normal limits for an adult to be attracted to a younger person under 18 with secondary sexual characteristics? It is not out of the realms of normal. It's just highly inappropriate. And we Mm -hmm. accept that as a society. And that's what really worries me about a lot of the political and ideological division in this country is there's a large movement that wants to lower that and make it okay through the marginalization of women and young girls of saying that it's okay to have these kind of feelings and marry off younger and younger women, which comes from sort of these you know, proto-evangelical movements. Yes. Yeah, you're talking our language how fucked up that is. (laughs) Yes, you are. 
Yeah, I and, and I would add, because I know people are probably thinking of it when they, they hear that, is that the research shows that it is normal for heterosexual men to be attracted to post-pubescent teenage girls. We don't find that so much in the reverse with straight women and being attracted to teen boys. Now, that comes up with a whole other <laughs> 10 other podcasts we could do about female sex <laughs> offenders and mm -hmm. you know teachers who offend um, with their students and things like that. But the research just doesn't super support that. So it does come down more to a mentality with women and the emotional, in air quotes, connectedness and stunted um, sort of maturity. Um, but with solicitation offenders, it's interesting because they're a tricky population because a lot of times it starts out online and then it crosses over into in-person contact offenses. So for we have a ton of data on each of those alone, but then when you have the one person that does cross over, it gets a little tricky. And I think we are still developing um, typologies of those types of folks. And it's like, well, how do you develop typologies? I found a paper this morning that I hadn't seen before, although it's from 2017, um, but it's from one of the leading researchers in the areas of child molestation and specifically internet crimes against children. But he even breaks down that there are sort of four typologies and one, they just call cyber sex only offenders. So these individuals, the fantasy is really just about talking to these children or teens online, and the majority of them never actually intend to go meet up with them, even though they might be talking about those things, like they're setting it up, but it it's typically we're finding it's more about the fantasy of just talking about it with the perceived child, because sometimes it is law enforcement on the other end. Can you so the pause that just one second, Dr. Shiloh? Yeah, that's one question I had. I, I have done a request for the case evidence file from Colorado, from El Paso County. Don't know if I'll get it, but I was unclear as to whether or not Steve thought he was communicating with the actual 14-year-old girl or someone who was going to provide this girl for his sexual mm, indulgence. That's different. So that I don't know. Interesting when you find yeah. that out, because that's going to kind of play into these typologies mm. that I'm going okay. through right now, because the way that they did this study is essentially going through all of the chats um, and a lot of the back and forth that was done online just to kind of even take the person out of it from interviewing them and getting their story is just looking at what their behavior was online. Got it. Um, so with these like cyber sex only offenders, they tended to be white men overwhelmingly. They tended to expose themselves to the victim, meaning like via webcam or sending, you know, explicit photos of themselves to the victim. And then nearly half of them asked for sexually explicit photos back from the victim. In their language um, and their conversations with the victim, about a third of them expressed some sort of interest in very child-specific or even incest themes. Mm. And they had they tended to have more protracted interactions with the victims, like for months. These guys put a lot of effort into their behavior online. But again, the, the talk of meeting up was very hypothetical. It was like someday and, and sort of things of that nature, which again, we hypothesize plays into the fantasy. So then, so it, I'm sorry, go that, ahead. Before you go on, that's also illegal though. I know the exchanging of photos is absolutely illegal, but is that communication back and forth also illegal? It depends on the jurisdiction. It is more difficult to prosecute because, mm -hmm. gosh, this is so hard. We, in, we've done quite a few episodes where we've touched on this idea of thought crimes, right? Like mm. how much of this is just fantasy and how much of this is there some intent behind it? But the idea is, is this a willing participant on the other end? So generally, and I, I know in California, it would probably fall under something like child annoying, which is if you're kind of speaking sexually to a child 
that's kind of a catch-all for a lot of just sort of creepy behavior with a kid <laughs> mm-hmm. is a, a simple way to put it. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it would depend on what um, penal code sections are out there that would sort of capture this. I might be wrong, but I don't think a lot of states have developed particularly a uh, a crime for having sexually explicit conversations with children because they're just so hard to prosecute Mm. um, in terms of like, again, what was the intent there? Um, And then if you're even trying to prove intent of meeting up, that would be even harder with this group. So then they go into um, another category, which they call cybersex slash schedulers. So these individuals often have the interactions for months as well, but they actually have a lot of discussion of meeting up. It doesn't mean that they always do. And actually, this group tends to be the group that cancels more often. Like they might make actual plans with a time and a date and a place, but they tend to cancel. So we don't know if that's because it's part of the fantasy to kind of take it that far or because they tend to um, have second thoughts of like, is this a trap or not? Once push comes to shove and Mm. and they've really made this date. Um, But we find the same things as far as these tend to be overwhelmingly white men. They do about half of them expose themselves to the victim and seek the sexually explicit victim um, photos. And they were actually the group that was more likely or most likely to express very child-specific or incest-specific interests and themes when they were going back and forth with the child. Hmm. So then you have your schedulers, which is the third group. So still predominantly white, but this included more non-white offenders than the previous two categories, if you will. They actually rarely expose themselves and very few of them sought photos of victims. It's almost as if once you get to schedulers, they're just kind of like, uh, I'm, I'm very like focused on this goal of meeting up for sex. So there's very little um, of the online grooming and talking. They're they're seeking more of, as the researchers put it, kind of a quick hookup. So they're not putting in a ton of effort. They're probably going to start talking sexually to this child a little quicker. And what I've hypothesized there is that they need to see who's going to be the one they're going to hook up with. They need to get through quickly. And if they find the one that's receptive, cool, then I'm going to follow that. I'm not going to put in a bunch of time and effort. Mm if this isn't going to pan out. It's interesting. They also find with this that the chats, um, the offender kind of lowers their self to the emotional immaturity of the victim in the chats that they have and the conversation with Mm -hmm. what they have with the child. So it's really, um, I think that is part of the grooming process, but it's, it's sort of this quick and dirty. Let's, let's just see if there's someone Mm -hmm. that's going to bite here. And then you have the last category, which they call buyers. So there is more of a seeking out. This this almost crosses over into more sex trafficking. This is more seeking ads of people that can provide sex with underage children. So I don't know if the case study that you guys started off with would fall into this, but generally they are responding to a classified ad for casual encounters, um, some of which feature minors or implied sexually deviant activity. And this is really a more ethnically diverse group of men. Again, it's very quick. It's it's not like they're going back and forth or sending pictures of themselves. They are inquiring about when and where. And this, this tends to happen uh, In areas, you know, like we we hear about like sex trafficking and uh, sex work and sexual child sexual abuse going up around like the Super Bowl, right? When there's a lot of um, vacations or businessmen or people coming to a specific location at a specific time and very quickly wanting to seek out sex while they're there. Wow. So it's it's interesting. I mean, there's there's a ton of other typologies that sort of break down offenders in this solicitation realm and all the way down to like how far are they willing to drive to get to this victim. So there is a lot of research out there. I okay. think it's just, you know, making the leap from 
is this just an online offense to, <laughs> will this cross over into a contact offense, which has kind of been the million dollar question for researchers. No, that's so good. <laughs> yeah, that um, that terminology too, non-contact offense being cyber, all that other stuff versus contact in-person victimization. Yes. Yeah. And one thing that I remember thinking in this is I don't think somebody goes from zero to a zillion in one step. So there's not any information in this particular, in the, in the court document and the reporting that we've seen thus far about any evidence of Steve having engaged in viewing child sexual abuse images. And a terminology I heard you guys give a distinction of that I really appreciated as well is the difference between pornography and sexual abuse images. Mm. Could you speak to that a little bit? And also, I, I know you can't diagnose, you haven't seen him or whatever, but the likelihood of there having been something to do with minors in viewing visual images prior to just, yeah, I'm going to pay 180 bucks and so I can fuck this little girl. Sorry for my language, but that's what he was doing. <laughs> <laughs> I can take those stats, but Scott, do you want to talk to about sexual child abuse images? Yeah. So what was it? There was a really famous um, politician years ago is when he was asked, this is during the Larry Flint Hustler federal oh, yeah. trials. And they were like, well, you know, Senator, what is pornography? And he said, well, I know when I see it. <laughs> <laughs> right. So the idea that but the distinction here that there is a legal distinction, and this is one of the reasons we don't use the term child pornography, because pornography is, again, using that word consent. You know, I mean, 99% of the time, right? If it's like media driven, Playboy, Playgirl, or any of those plethora of magazines, that is consent. Those, those models consented to that. And they, regardless of how young they look, some of them, you know, some magazines that tend to go for younger models, you know, they have very strict rules about what is legal. They have to have signed, you know, they have to check the birth certificates. I mean, it's a, there's a real procedure there. So what we did was, or not we, or the, I mean, uh, the, the law enforcement population around taking these actions and protecting our youth was to really define this term child sex endangerment images mm. is what these photos are. And they are about, so you see there's each one of those is a qualifier. So they are sex. Oh, yeah. It is graphic. Um, it may be mean nudity or it may only mean partial nudity or there may be no nudity, but it can still be a child sex endangerment image so that that could differentiate from pornography. Because, again, there was this sort of ignorant drive to lump everything together. So good. Yeah. And you'll you'll still find I mean, in, when you're looking at court records and you're looking at how the crimes are categorized, it will say possession of child pornography, distribution of child pornography, right? Like that, it, that's just what they're calling it there in the treatment realm and hopefully in the media to shift that into child sexual abuse images or child sexual endangerment Im images is really just to start getting us out of this idea that it's a product that is being peddled, um, mm -hmm. that there's an actual victim there. That is so important. I love, uh, thank you for pointing that out. It's really, really important, especially in our circles with consent. The more that we can do to change language is, you know, part of our mission just with having the, our podcast. Um, but there is actually information as far as when we look at solicitation offenders, what is their background? And if you just look at documented criminal history for them, with the samples that have been studied, only about 5% showed that they had previous contact offenses in their background. Now, that's their criminal record. But once they got into treatment and they were able to be interviewed and or self-report in anonymous surveys, there's a big survey that was done at one of the prisons many, many years ago where we got kind of astounding information, more specifically with child pornography offenders. But if we're just talking solicitation offenders, once they self-reported, it was almost 30% of them, they admitted to a contact offense that was never known about before. Mm. So almost a third had done something previously. 
And depending on the study that you look at, there's quite a gap, but between 20 and 40 percent had child sexual abuse images on their computer when they were caught for solicitation. Wow. But predominantly, they were tending to focus on victims between the ages of 13 and 15. Um, so that post-pubescent teenage age range, which, and it, I don't think we said this sort of qualifier when we talked about pedophilia and hebophilia. Pedophilia, you can be exclusive or non-exclusive. Those are sort of the subcategories. Exclusive means you are literally only attracted to prepubescent children. Non-exclusive can be also attracted to adults. And those are individuals are obviously easier to work with in treatment because they have another way in which their sexual needs can be met. Um, when we talk about hebophilia and those focusing on that age range, they can also be attracted to adults. It just means that that age range is their preferred sexual attraction, if that makes okay. sense. And we see more of that where there's sort of that attraction to both, um, where it's non-exclusive, if you will, for those that meet the criteria for hebophilia. It's just their primary interest is that age range, even though they might be married or they might date adult women. But right. yeah, I mean, there's there's some concerning information about the backgrounds and the previous offending behavior of solicitation offenders. That is concerning. I know it would vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but is it standard procedure if someone has been uh, arrested for solicitation involving a minor to also then go and seize all of their electronic devices and search for child sexual abuse images? Oh, yeah. I, I think that would be very common procedure to get okay. every device out of that home. It would be very easy to write a search warrant for that once you have the initial offense. So yeah, they're 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 okay. certainly looking for everything that will stick because solicitation is a little bit difficult sometimes. It's tricky where computer offenses, the evidence is right there. Right you have there. it. Right there. You have it. I know we're really coming up on time. I was looking at that acronym I said, S-O-I-S-P, the Offender Intensive Supervision Probation Program. Do you have any stats on how successful those programs are? Oh, that's a great question. I, I don't. Um, so that would be similar to in California. We have KSOM was the California Sex Offender Management Board. Um, it's the overseeing board who determines really how it and it, it includes mental health professionals. And, um, you know, think of it as a little bit of a think tank and who's then going to set the policy and procedure for people that are getting out of prison and how they will be monitored in the community. And what kind of treatment they will get, making sure the best, most evidence-based risk assessment tools are being done. So I guess in, in a way to answer your question, recidivism for sexual offenses is much lower than I think people would think. When I usually pose that question, I get anything from 50 to 100% will reoffend. If we look at a, all sexual offenses, which I know it's different, if if we had time to break it down, that would be great. But we're looking at 15, one, five percent reoffend. Um, sex offender treatment, it, it, I pause because it pains me to say this. Sex offender treatment actually isn't hugely statistically significant in reducing recidivism. Mm. Now, I don't think that means we should do away with it. And Scott and I will tell you those anecdotal experiences of working with someone, knowing they're getting their risk factors and understanding them and making changes to make sure they never reoffend. And to me, those moments were worth every single year I ever put in to working with this population. But the overall research shows that it doesn't make a huge significant impact in lowering recidivism rates overall. What does? So it just we need more research. We need on continual research. Okay. This has gone so fast. It has. <laughs> and been so fascinating. So fascinating. And so wonderful. And I know that we have just kind of scratched the surface. Of course, I'm going to put a plug in again for our listeners and we'll put in the show notes. So much great information and education that you guys offer in your podcast plus a lot of fun and snark. So they'll have fun listening as well. Mm -hmm. As we wrap up here, is there anything else that uh, Shiloh or Scott that you would like to say to 
our listening audience? Well, I would just want to say I have so much admiration for you two as hosts. And, you know, uh, I, I wish, I hope that our country will get to a place where we talk about this more, about mm -hmm. the impact of coercive and oppressive religious mm -hmm. doctrine and dogma and isolation. You know, it's it's no different from the fingers that we point at other countries and other cultures that do this to women and minors. And I think you're doing really important work and, you know, there's a way you know, and you guys are part of the way for people that are survivors and moving out of that world. So keep up the good work. Thank you. And, and listeners out there know that you're not alone. You know, I'm glad that you're, you're all listening and finding your path out. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I mean, it's it's always a pleasure for us to get out in front of different audiences. Mm -hmm. And this has certainly been that opportunity. Um, and we just we can't thank you enough for that. You know, after seven years of podcasting, it's very exciting to feel like we're not just sort of swimming in the same circle. Um, so I'm really glad we've made this connection. And I knew with four of us, an hour and a half would go by like nothing. <laughs> it would go by so fast. Yeah. You guys have been amazing and excellent. And I am very excited to introduce our audience to your podcast because yeah. it's the same thing. We all tend, I love that. We all tend to swim in some same circles. And so this is this has been so important for us to expand um, with your research and your definitions. Awesome. Thank you, guys. And we may have to talk again later about the whole cult thing. Happy to. Yeah. Because you guys got some great insights on that. So yeah. maybe maybe another day. Let's do it. Yes. <laughs> wow. You know, Shiloh and Scott are just incredible to me. I mean, their range of experience and their depth of evidence-based knowledge. You know, I, I really, really value that. And I am just so grateful they were willing to take the time with us <laughs> to share those insights and help us start to put some framework around this shit pile. Yes. And they're very busy people as well. And so we are particularly honored that they gave up their weekend morning. They're out on the West Coast, which is a different time zone than we are, mm -hmm. uh, to be able to meet with us. And there's so there's so much I'm still pondering, so many nuggets to think through. And again, from our perspective of you can't solve something if you can't even agree on what the problem is and what are the causes. And so really I'm grateful for their work that they're doing and very glad that we could share it on this space with people who probably haven't heard them before. Right, right. So folks, as we said at the outset, there are these other things that we want to follow up with on this whole topic. Of course, it's the experience of learning that someone we thought we knew could mm -hmm. be guilty of something so horrific. And we're going to look more closely at what exactly happened there with him and this crime. And we're going to delve into the lead up of it all, which is going to bring us back to the tie in with the 1970s Jesus movement. The motherfucking Jesus <laughs> movement. <laughs> well, wait a second. I, I've been looking at it more and more, Tracy. And you know, the Jesus that we thought we were following in the beginning, mm. that dude's cool. But that's not, the, he He got corrupted. So anyway, but well, that's the next episode. and there's next so episode. much <laughs> to go into, which I'm excited to do. Uh, yeah, yeah. But as far as, I'll just add this little nugget. All of those people who came from so much trauma and had some very deep-seated issues, it all got glossed over in the Jesus movement, right? So, yeah. yes, we all wanted, you know, what what he stood for at that time. But Jesus really wasn't the answer to some really deep-seated mental and emotional issues as we all are living out today. That's right. Mm. Amen, sister. Amen. So with that, we are wanting, you know, to dive into that. And of course, Steve Grison, I don't know if we said it here, but actually produced a whole film on the Jesus movement and that first love and how exciting that was. So it's going to be very appropriate and it's going to mm -hmm. all interconnect here. And so we are hoping to be back on our regularly scheduled time, which is dropping every two weeks. <laughs> and can I just can I just do a side and go, 
<laughs> yeah, but the ha 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 is totally me, Tracy centered because no, no, no. <laughs> there's been a lot of life happening in the midst of all of this, right? Well, I'm about to have a lot of life too. I'm on standby I to go know. to Tennessee because our 10th granddaughter, oh my God, well, 10th grandchild <laughs> who happens to be a girl is about to be born. So I'm going to have grandma duty soon. So it's not just you. It's other stuff in my life that might have us delaying. But we're going to try not to, folks. We're going to try to be on gonna time. We're going to try not to <laughs> because it has, even though life has happened and life has been happening for me, there's so much to ponder through this because, of course, those children that we talked about were raised in all of this. Yeah. And the more healing that we get and the more insight that we get and the more that we're able to go, oh, God, that was really fucked up, the better it is in our own relationship. So it's all interconnected, yes. Sharon. It's all interconnected. And so for those listeners who worry about us, let me tell you that this has actually been a gift for us because we've been able to see things and acknowledge things that I don't think on this level we would have been able to if we hadn't been kind of doing this and diving yeah. in. Would you agree? I totally agree. I totally agree. So thank you. Thank you to our listeners. Thank you for your feedback. Thank you for your messages. Um, we are going to try to get back on our regularly scheduled programming, but you guys have been great and you're patient with us and we will keep you posted. And in the meantime, you can be part of the conversation with others by asking to join our Facebook group, Feet of Clay, Confessions of the Cult Sisters Community. Yes. And don't forget to follow us on Instagram. I have been really good for a long period of time about being daily. And I did also take a little small break on that, but it's <laughs> going to be back up this week. And we're going to post some really cool things, especially... If you guys heard it in our interview, Dr. Scott, Dr. Scott. <laughs> so for those of you who know that reference, be ready for some fun Instagram pictures. Yay. <laughs> All right, everybody. There is a bunch of links in the show notes for this episode as well. And until next time, be good to yourselves. Love each other. Talk soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.